Well, thank you very much for inviting me to come here and speak about these issues. As, you know, as you know, Mexico it has a, a the topic of oil in Mexico is a very complicated one. We have a long history with the with, with oil, and finally, after many many years, we were able to carry out a reform of that market. So what I'm going to address today will be first explain a little bit about the reform and take a quick overview of the challenges and the opportunities that uh, bring the, that the reform brings to people in Mexico and also here in Texas and then we're going to I want to refer to to a uh, an instrument that we have created in Mex in Coahuila specifically to try to deal with the challenges and take the best uh, of the opportunities that present to us. And then we'll go into some of those challenges, those that have to do with sustainability and those that have to do with the efficiency of the, of the operation in oil and gas. So first, let's, let's see what the reform process was. As I mentioned, for oil was nationalized in Mexico in 1938. And after that, that was a very complicated process. And uh, because Mexico was left with the oil, but with no uh, technicians, nor plants, nor equipment to exploit it. So Mexico had to start from the bottom up to develop those resources. And over the years, we managed to do it. But as everything in life, you know, as they get old, things start not to function that well. And a lot of uh, complaints and a lot of problems began to arise. And so the conditions were created for the reform to be viable, political, politically speaking. So in, in 2013, there was an initiative presented. There were other initiatives in Congress presented by different groups, but this one was presented by the executive. So Congress lumped together all the initiatives that were there, and they started working. From July to December, they had public hearings, a very heated debate, you know, some party, uh, threatened to take over Congress and so as not to allow the discussions to take place. But fortunately enough, there were strong votes and strong support for the reform. And finally, on December 20th, Congress approved a reform to change three articles of the Constitution, the 25th, the 27th, and the 28th. And since there is a lot of uh, distrust among political parties, as is the case in most countries, in Mexico is particular, particularly acute. They had to put in the reform 21 provisions that were the main guidelines for the secondary regulations that will be approved later after the, the, the constitutional reform was approved. You know, I don't know here, but in Mexico for a constitutional reform to be approved, it has to be approved by a qualified uh, majority in Congress, 66% of the vote. Then it has to go to all the state congresses and have a majority of those approving the, the reform. And the, the, the thing is that the state cannot move a, a comma that the Congress has already approved because that will make a very, a never ending process. So finally, in December, it was approved and was published. Then, last year in April, the initiatives to create, to reform 12 existing laws and create nine new ones was presented to Congress. This, this uh, initiative was to give life to the 21 provisions that were already approved, you know, to develop into what we call secondary legislation. Uh, so also we had a debate, public hearings, debate in, from April to August. And finally, in August, Congress approved the new regulation. After that, the reform has, and 
institutions have been working very hard to, to carry out the, 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 the new reform. What does the new reform mean? Well, it means a whole set of new institutions and reform of the existing ones. At the state level, there were very clear definitions of, of what each one of the executive departments have to do. Energy department, which is called CENER in Spanish, is in charge of dictating energy policies. Uh, the Treasury Department, SHCP, is in charge of setting the fiscal conditions and the economic assumptions for, uh, for, the, for the new market. The SE, which is the, the Department of Economy, that's responsible for uh, looking at the national content. One of the purposes and one of the things that made it possible to sell the, the reform to people in Mexico was that there was going to an effort be made so as to have in the new activities and in the new market that they will use Mexican uh, labor, Mexican products and Mexican manufacturers to a certain percentage that will have to increase over time. And we'll see some of that later on. Then the uh, environmental department is also in charge of that. L then we have what we call the coordinated regulatory bodies. The first two of them already existed, but they were reinforced and given more attributions. And, and the last one was, is a new one uh, created for safety and environmental protection, which is part of the department. This. I, I want to pit, uh, point out, this is a very important thing of the, of the reform. When the, you see the CNH, which is the National Hydrocarbons Commission, uh, they are in charge of, the, of gathering all the ge geological information that was stored in Pemex, more than uh, 70 years of the history of Pemex doing exploratory works all over the country and that was in the possession of Pemex, they had, Pemex had to turn it over to the, this commission. And also the new information that will be coming available as private uh, investors uh, enter this market, that will be the place where they will have to, uh, to uh, end, uh, give all the information that they, they are gathering. But they are also responsible for the bidding and contracting process. And this is a very important thing. Why is that? Because, and there was a, a, a huge discussion in Mexico, who should be the responsible for do, carrying out the bidding? There were some people who thought that the uh, department, the Department of Energy should be responsible. And other people thought that we needed a, uh, an autonomous body. And finally, and for, for the good, I think, the, the commission won, and the, the, the reason is very simple. In Mexico, the president has the power to appoint and dismiss the secretaries. He doesn't have to go to Congress except for the uh, attorney general for approval. It's not like here that the president appoints and then has to go to a hearing and sometimes they get approval and sometimes you don't. But anyway, you have to take a good care of who you appoint because you don't want to be embarrassed by being turned down. So the president has absolute power to, to, to appoint and dismiss. So what may happen in Mexico, and, and they don't have any requirements as to the knowledge or profession or, or experience of the people you are appointing, because you don't have to give a, account to anyone. In the case of the commission, you have requirements. Nobody can be, not anyone can be a commissioner. You have to have the experience, the background, the, the technological background for, to, to be appointed. And then you have to be approved by, by the Senate. So this, this uh, method of appointing the commissioners gives more confidence to the public, to the investing public, that the people that are there will be really autonomous people that 
because the, 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 the time period to serve is also defined in the Constitution, and you cannot be removed unless something very bad you, uh, is char charged to you. But the president will, won't be able to dismiss you. <coughs> so that, that's a, a good thing, and that is a very important because, you know, uh, corruption, we have issues with that in, in the present going on, and so we have to be very careful with this reform. And the other thing is the Mexican Petroleum Fund. That's a, also a very important part of the reform, and a very good one, because the management of the income now will not be decided just by the Treasury Department, or was the case before the reform. You know, Pemex was subject to a tax of 60 to 65 percent of gross income. So that is very, very hard for any, for any company to live and survive when you have to pay 65 percent of your income uh, as taxes. So now the, the income goes to the, this fund, and there are very specific rules what uses those funds can be put to. You cannot, as, uh, the Treasury Department has limits. They are restricted to just a part of that. And the rest has to be, to be invested in uh, assets that are you know, going to substitute the one that you are destroying when you extract the, the, the hydrocarbon from, this, from the ground. And Pemex, which is the, the state company has been transformed into, it's no longer a department of the executive, now it's, it's a, 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 a company. They call it a state productive company. It's owned by the government, but it's not managed by the government anymore. So they have an independent body of uh, board of directors, and it's supposed that the influence of Hacienda, of the Treasury Department especially, will decrease over time and let payments be just like the rest of the companies that we participate in in this market. So this is the fiscal part. There, we have three different types of uh, contracts for EMP. Production sharing, profit sharing, and licenses. And they have to pay in corporate income tax, surface, surface rent, state and local taxes, a, a basic royalty. There is the payment that you offer to the state above the, the royalty. And this concept of re re cost recovery, how much you are allowed to deduct every year from your income to recover your expenses. And an adjustment mechanism when the market changes. The corporate income tax is 30%. The rent for the first 16 months, you will pay 1,100 Mexican pesos. It will be a little less than $100 uh, per uh, square kilometer. And uh, the following, after that, you'll pay 20, 2,700. Will be, you know, about twice the first figure. And you pay also state and local taxes. For, when you're in the exploration phase of the project, you will pay 1,500 uh, 1, pesos for uh, square kilometers. And where you, you are already producing, you'll pay 60, 16, 600 pesos per square kilometer. And these are the, uh, the numbers taken from the first round, which refers to shallow waters exploration. You know, the royalty is 7.5% when the price of oil is below $48. And there is a formula to escalate that when the price rises. And for natural gas, when you are uh, exploring for natural gas or producing natural gas, if the price is below $5, you'll pay no royalty. And if it's above that, you'll pay, a, according to the formula there, uh, uh, a royalty. And for condensates, it's uh, the same. They uh, will allow you to deduct 60% of your expenses every year. You know, 
in, in oil businesses, usually the first year are very heavy on expenses. So what this means, you won't be able to, to deduct all your expenses in the first year, but you can carry them forward and you will recover that money eventually. But the problem is here with this uh, adjustment mechanism. And that's been still being reviewed by, by the government. There is a lot of pressure to change that. Let's say an example that when you bid, you offer to pay the state 20% of your net income, and you will keep 80%. But you have also to, to uh, you have as a, an internal rate of return of 20%, and based on that, you offer the, you know, the 20, 80 distribution. But if your internal rate of return increases, the, the share of the government will increase. But it's very aggressive, because for every point, the percentage point that of internal rate of return increase, the government share will increase four points. So when you reach 35 percent, you will be even you even though you offer 20 percent, the government will be taking 80 percent, and you will keep 20 percent. So that's not good, and. And the problem is that if that's the case and if that stands, what will happen is that firms will be very careful to hold their horses when they are getting near the 20%. They will lower the rate of advance or they will find some way of cheating so as to lower the, the rate of return of the investment. And the local content you, has to be 25% when, when you start, and has to increase by 1% over the years until you reach 20, uh, 35% in 2025. That seems like a lot, but actually it's not, because right now uh, the, 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 the contract that payments was awarded to private before the reform, because they were service contract. Usually they were having more than a national content greater than that. So that should not be no, no problem for any company who wishes to participate. And this is how the, the bidding process takes place. First, there is, the first step is to sign the contract. The Energy Department and the National Hydrocarbons Commission will define which areas will be offered in the bid. Then Hacienda or the Treasury will define the fiscal conditions for that uh, contract. And energy will set the technical guidelines, you know, according to the, the energy policy in place. Then is the bidding process. You have the guidelines from the energy department, but the responsible for the bidding will be the National Hydrocarbon uh, Commission. And the private investor or Pemex, eventually, in some cases, Pemex will be allowed to participate in the bidding as any other company. When they, if they win, there will be the, the signing of the contracts. The operation is overseed by, overseed by the, the National Commission and by the uh, the safety and environmental agency has regarding questions of industrial safety and environmental issues. And the management of income is through the petroleum fund that I explained before. They will receive the money and they will pay each of the players the, the share that belongs to them according to the contract that we're signed. The market is huge. You know, there was a first round well, there was a, a round. The biddings are carried out by rounds. There was a, a round that was called round, round zero. That was exclusive for Pemex. And the idea, Pemex requested what uh, they wanted to keep of what they are doing now. And then the government reviewed that and decided what to accept and give to Pemex. So Pemex got 83% of what 
we call the you know proven reserves, and 17% is open for a private bidding. And of the prospective resources, PEMIS got only 21%, and the rest is open for private investor. So in total, you have 68, 68% of, percent of 141 billion barrels of, of oil equivalent open for private investor. That's a huge, a huge market. And that means huge opportunities. This is the, the places where the, that are included in the first round for privates. The blue ones, well, there are two blues. The dark blue is for extraction, the lighter blue for exploration. The red ones are some lots that belong to Pemex, but for some reason Pemex doesn't want to to develop the, the resources themselves, so they are offering uh, a joint venture to private companies to come and develop those, those areas. And PEMES already has some contracts with privates signed by a, on a different type of contract on the old law. So they are migrating those contracts to the new contractual forms that are allowed by the reform. And this is how we go. The first, uh, the first uh, bid was shallow water exploration started in December of last year. And by July of this year, we expect to, to know the, the, the winners. There are 39 companies that were, uh, of those 48, nine interested, 39 were accepted, and they are participating in the bid. And they are bidding for 14 blocks. So there will be 14 winners. Then the second one is shallow waters production. It started in February. And sometime in September, we'll know the, the winners. In that bid, is five blocks are, were offered. And then next month, around the 10th of May, we'll have the third Licitation, uh, which will be for mature fields, uh, will be around 29 blocks that will be offered. And the idea is for, in these blocks, they expect the Mexican companies may start participating. Because the first two ones were, the, the standards for qualifying were, were set very, very high, so that given that Mexico, the only one company with experience in oil, and gas was Pemex, so <laughs> it was not easy for anyone when they ask, you know, you have to have, the, you know, 10 years of experience and have produced uh, 5,000 barrels or 100 barrels per day. So the only one who ha has done that was Pemex. So in here they will s put a different kind of standard so that Mexican companies can, can participate and compete. Then we'll have Deep waters will be the next. That'll be around August, July, August, when that process is start. That also is for big companies because the technology there is very complicated. And then we'll have the unconventional that are the ones that are of interest to Coahuila because we have, you know, the, the we'll see it in a little while. The Eagle Force Shell formation comes into Mexico and in the state of Coahuila and then turns down to Tamaulipas. <clears throat> or, if you look at it from the south, it goes into Texas. <laughs> so, as you see, we have many, many opportunities. Coahuila has lots of opportunities because we have 24% of the national unconventional resources are located in Coahuila. So that's a huge, a huge amount of oil and gas resources. But we have to face lots and lots of challenges. There are challenges that have to do with the sustainability of the activities, which refer to land rights, to community relations, to water, 
to environment. And also there are challenges that have to, that affect the efficiency of the operation. You know, the human resources, the innovation and technology, logistics of the supply chain, and infrastructure. You have the experience here of the Eagle Force Shell. You have better infrastructure, more human resources available for this activity because this activity has been for a long time here in Texas. In Coahuila it's new. And in Mexico it's not new, but there was only one company. There was not, what is new is the private market for those resources. And it's gonna be a very important one in the future. Payments will remain, will grow perhaps, but won't grow very fast. What will grow will be the private part of the, of the markets. So we need resources, we need technology. We don't have a well-developed uh, supply chain. And well, the, our infrastructure is already, without the reform, is, is insufficient. So you can imagine what will happen when you start seeing all those trucks going up and down the, the roads. Here, they destroy many, many roads in, the, in, the, in that region, in the Eagle Force Shell region. I, I've traveled a lot through, through, through those counties, and it's amazing. So when I see that, I say, well, what is, will happen in Coahuila when, when we have this thing going? It will be just, you know, crazy. So we have to do something. And what we did in Coahuila, is to create a cluster. A cluster as a non-profit organization, a cluster that articulates the efforts of governments, universities, research centers, and businesses. Right now we have three research centers, very good ones. In Coahuila we have one of the best research centers that have to do with oil and gas. You know, the, the story of that, I, I love it because I, once I was the, the chairman of the board of that uh, company, and when it was, it used to be called, uh, it was an institute for research on metallurgical and, uh, and steel. But when the government privatized the steel companies in Mexico, that's why it was located in Saltillo because the, the, the steel companies were in Monclova. But then they sold the steel companies, and what do we do with this, with this research center? So they say, well, they convert the, the, the research center into a business, the, a public business, and they took away all the subsidies, and they say, well, you have the equipment, you have the people, and See how you, it goes. And they survive. And they are doing very well. Right now they have over 2,000 engineers with masters and doctorates all over Mexico. The, the, head, the, the headquarters are in, located in Saltillo. And they are working with us in the cluster. So we have 11 uh, high education uh, institutions, the University of Coahuila among them. We have 50 companies and business organizations working with us in the cluster. We have the 17 municipal governments that are in the area where the resources are located, and the state government of Coahuila. What we try, the, the, the main purpose of this cluster is to articulate the efforts of these different actors to create conditions that will allow that the exploitation and development of the resources will generate regional development that is sustainable and that benefits you know, the people in Mexico. And take that as our basis for comp competitiveness. How we do it? We have six working committees. In each one, people from the different sectors participate, government, business, universities, research centers, to deal with human resources, infrastructure, supply chain, innovation and technology, environmental, and land rights. 
I will not go into all, what all of these do. I will just refer to some of, of them, but if you have any question at the end, I'll gladly uh, answer them. I will refer to some of the, of the challenges. The first one will be community relations and social lines. This is something that is very important in a country like Mexico. You know, here, if you have an issue with your land, uh, the, the, the landowner that is uh, leasing you the, the mineral rights or the, uh, the, uh, the right to use the land, well, you go to a court and you solve it there. But in, a, in developing countries, and in countries where there is a huge uh, contrast of the uh, distribution of income, you need more than that. So that's where the concept of social license comes, is that you, if you're going to be in that community, because all the, the activities will take place like it is here in small communities. You know, Carrizo Spring was, what, 2,000 people when the, the boom started uh, in 2010, or around that year. And a few years later, it was like eight, nine, ten thousand people. Can you imagine what it means to double or triple the population of a small community? Huge problems. So these are the, town, the, the communities involved and the population they have now. Guerrero, for example, has 1.9. Last year and the year before, there was a project there. They were to do a, a 3D seismic exploration in 1,500 kilometers, square kilometers. They brought like 600 people to work. And if we will ask all the people from Guerrero to move out, there will be not enough houses to accommodate the, the, the newcomers. So they had to build uh, men camps, what they call. And also, there is weak presence of federal agencies in the region. And the federal government, is, since it's a federal, as in contrast to here, that all the things related to oil and gas are usually uh, of the state level government responsibility, in Mexico is federal. But they don't have the institutional capacity to take care of those problems. And also, there is another thing that the law mandates that a percentage of the income, or a percentage, a certain amount, is not, has not been defined yet, will be defined in every contract, shall be given from operators to community for human development. And this is where it, be it becomes very, very important, because you need to create a working and lasting relation with those communities. This is like a marriage. You're going to be there for 20, 30, 40 years. So you need to have a way of communicating, of solving issues when there are uh, misunderstanding or something that affects or aggra aggravates any of the parties. You have to have uh, you know, mechanism to, to work those out without the community going and blocking your access to the resource or what have you. You know, we have examples of that. I don't know if you have it here. Well, I saw it in this morning in Baltimore. It's kind of different, but in the end, it's the same type of problem. You know, people is not happy with something, and they find a way of showing it. <clears throat> so the challenge here, how are you going to set the priorities for that money to be spent? And how are you going to manage that money? Because if you give it, let's say, to the mayor, or if you give it to, in, in, the, in the case of Mexico, we have this the system of property ejidos, and they have their authorities, but they change every three years. The same with the mayors. So you give it to either one of them, just like that, well, they'll be gone in three years. And you're gonna stay 20 or 30 years. So you need to develop First, a set of priorities that make sense. You are destroying an asset of that community, which is the resource underneath the ground. So you have to invest the money that is produced by that in something that will give that back, that community, 
a permanent asset. So you can invest in human capital, educational, scholarship, things like that, or you can invest in uh, infrastructure that will enhance the uh, productive capabilities of that community, or you can finance projects, non-oil projects, so that people there can start developing other activities so by the time that the oil is finished, that community will have something to live on and will not be a ghost uh, town. And for that, you need priorities and how you are going to manage the resource. And there is no other way but to get the community involved. You know that the relevant people with the more open and transparent mechanisms manage the resources so that everybody feels the benefit of having that project in your community. If, if that doesn't happen, you are sowing the seed for the discontent in the future. Water. Well, in this case, you know more about water than I do, so bear with me. What are the problems that we have? Well, we have one that is already there. We didn't need the reform to have it, to see it, which is the, the fact that there is a, a deficit in the supply-demand relation of the water that is on the Rio Bravo, the Rio Grande. And <clears throat> there are new, new problems, new challenges, which is where the water for the new activities will come from, and what are we going to do to manage the flow back water? Which is a very touchy issue. As regards the first one, what we have here is we have a deficit. In 2013, it was a huge deficit. As you can see, that year we had a very high uh, drought rate in Mexico. So it reflected on the the following years, 2014 and 2015, we have improved our rain. Well, we didn't improve it. No, the nature did it, but we benefited from it. And so what we see is uh, when rain is above average, we are in a very shaky balance. You know, just bringing your nose up the water, no? But when you have normal years, we have a problem, even without the new activities. So we decided to estimate what the new, acti the new demands for the new activities will be. And this doesn't take into account the, the effect that the new activities will have on population and the needs for food and so on. So this is just assuming that you do 200 wells per year, or 320, or 500. We constructed these scenarios on the basis, first we look at the experience in Eagle Fort Shell, which is well above that. And then we saw the availability of rigs and all the, the, the expert opinions of people on the field, Pemex, perhaps we don't know how, how good a, an estimate it is, but I think at least for the first 10, 15 years, that'll be the, the, you know, will be in that range, from 200 to 500. That is in Coahuila, not all Mexico. And so with, with that, we estimated the, the requirements of water. In the most optimistic case, will be 8.5 millions of uh, cubic meters of, of water. So we then look how much water is available from ground sources. So we took what the rights, outstanding rights are for the different usage of, uh, of water, agriculture, livestock, industrial, multiple uses, and human services, and compare with the, with the water availability, of groundwater availability for those basins. And it turned out that we have enough water, 28 and 9, in the relevant aquifers. So if you look at this, 
In the high scenario, we'll need 8.5 million uh, qu uh, cubic feet, I mean, meters of water. And, but we have water rights available that will cover that, at least theoretically. So what we can see from this exercise is that the water for the new activities could be met by ground resources. But we have the, the challenge to solve the issue of this treatment and disposal of flow back water. And also the problem, the issue of the Rio Grande balance, which, as I mentioned before, is barely reach when we have a very good rain years. But even there, with the new activities, the new population, the new demands for the new population, I, 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 I'm not presenting the estimation, but we did an uh, estimation of the impact of these activities on population on those communities. Just to give you an idea of the, of the, uh, of the, the, the impact, uh, the, the population council in Mexico, who is responsible for estimating population uh, and making projections, had estimated that uh, in, in that region, the, in the next 15 years, the population will grow by 1% per year. With this, either the low or the high or the medium scenarios, that will move, you know, in the highest scenario, from 1%, the, the population growth will go to 4%, a little less than 4%. So that's huge. And in the, in the low, it will be from 1% to 2.5%. So either case, it's a lot of people, and that's more water, more food, more everything. What we did that for? Because we are working in, remember I mentioned the infrastructure committee? We're working with the communities, with the communities, with that information to build long-term urban and social infrastructure planning. How many doctors you'll need, how many schools, how many hospitals, how much water, uh, police, uh, uh, and all the public services that are the responsibility of the municipalities. <coughs> so that they have something to use when they start receiving the money. You remember that some of the money will be going to states and, uh, and municip municipal government. So we wanted them to have these analytical instruments so that they invest the money that will be receiving in a, very, in a way that is consistent with the new economic reality of those, of those communities. But coming back to water, this is a projection of the Rio Bravo water gap by 2030. So as you can see, it's, it's going to be 33% of the demand. So that's huge. This is the supply, the different uses, including the international water trade. And uh, <clears throat> so things just don't add up. We need to do something. And there is an estimate that is being, you know, the authorities and other uh, interests. We in the closer are doing some research on this too. What do we have to do? Well, we have to work on the demand and we have to work on the supply. And we have to work also on the management of the system. In agriculture, we have to move more intensely to better irrigation techniques. What do you call the sprinklers or the focalized irrigation? We have to, in human public, there is a very touchy issue there that we have to solve. The, the, the system for municipalities to pay the rights for the usage of water. It's a very complex, the way it is now, it has the incentive for municipalities to cheat. They declare that they are going to draw from the rivers, let's say 10 million uh, cubic meters per year. Then they go to the bank here in San Antonio, 
the NAFTA Bank, and they ask, they present a project to build a 50 million uh, cubic meter for a water treatment plant. I say, how come you only are extracting 10 million and you want to treat 50 million? Well, the reality is they are extracting the 50 million, but they only pay for the 10 million because of the way the, 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 the right uh, payments is established. So we have to solve that so that we know the truth, and knowing the truth, we'll know how to handle the problem. And uh, we also have to build more infrastructure, look at surface water and the groundwater, and also there are some ideas of some aqueducts that will uh, increase the efficiency in which we use the water. There's a lot of water lost. You know, when you go from Presa Falcón to Matamoros, or to Brownsville on the other side, and, uh, and, and you use that water for irrigation, so you can transport the water in a different way so that you can save a lot, lot of water. And as you see, doing that will solve a big chunk of the problem, 70% of the problem. But also we have to move and to, how are we doing with the time? Fine? Fine. Well, we have to do, uh, work on management work. Here the experience of Australia is very good. You had a, 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 a person from Australia last year talk about that, so I'm gonna skip that. And go into the problem of Mexico. In Mexico, land is federally owned. And so you have to get a, some type of concession to use the water. And it's very inefficient. Very, very inefficient. And so what we've been doing in the last years is creating water banks to try to match supply and demand. And there is a new law that has been discussed in, 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 in Congress. The law has some issues stalled in Congress, and Congress is about to recede, uh, and we have new elections in, elections in, Ju in June, the first Sunday of June, so there'll be a new Congress, so that, nothing will happen in that front until the new Congress is uh, in, installed. But it still, it's a very complicated issue, because somehow, I think it was, misrepresented to Congress, the law was not well explained or lobbied, and people think it's a way of privatizing the, the water, which is not because you're not changing the Constitution. You have to change the Constitution to privatize. But it's still, you know, it's, it's a problem, but it's a, a, an urgent need that the, we, we need to make the, the clarify the responsibilities of every level of government, which are not clear now. We have to establish a, a new pricing system for, to carry out the right incentives to each one of the actors in the, involved. And we need to have a very efficient system for trading rights and changing the use of water, provided that you maintain the priority for, which is on the Constitution, so that we won't change the for human consumption. Beyond that, you will have the oil industry competing with the make beer industry or other industry that make a, that use lots of water. And the problem will be with agriculture that you will have to have some, because when you look at the amount of water, or I mean the, the value added per per liter. Obviously, oil is first place, and most of agriculture activities last place. So you have to solve that in some way, because you, we cannot, uh, you know, reduce. So the way to do it will be to invest on more efficient use of, uh, of water per for agriculture. Uh, the other problem is with environment. There we have. The need is to minimize the impact of the activities. There is lack of information, at least not easily available. 
and you need to keep the communities informed. There is a lot of noise going on on the, on the net. People show, you open the, the, the faucet in your house and whoosh, a fire. Some people say that is not true, so other people say it is. We don't really know. And to achieve full information disclosure. We are working on that. And I want to finish with the human resources. This is the, the challenge that we have. Right now, without the reform, 60, the coverage of high school is 67%. And in high, higher education is 37%. So even without the reform, we need to do something because that, those are lower numbers, low numbers. We know we have to train and form professionals. We know what type of professional from Pemex experience we need to form and from experience from other countries. But look at this. This is the, the size of the challenge. Our capacity to the graduate people in Coahuila now, and at high, high school technicians and professionals, is 3,000 per year. And we will be needing 12,000 per year. Over 15, we have 15 years to, to do it. It's not for tomorrow, but, <laughs> but it still is a huge. What are we, going, uh, are we doing to do for that? We created a program that is going to be financed by the federal government to develop the, to develop the, uh, the resources that we need. And we have five specific programs for that. We have been able to quantify you know, the needs. For example, we need 120 specialized teachers in the next uh, three years or four years. We need to train 10,000 professionals and 24,000 technicians and workers over the four year period. We have to create two new research centers and two new universities and double the investment. So we, we have calculated that it will cost uh, around $15 million per year for the next four years. And we have secured the financing from the federal government to carry out this, this program. So I think we're in a good standing in that front and we'll be able to, to move at a reasonable pace. It's a huge effort because it's not easy to find the teachers or the, or the, uh, the expertise to, you know, to form other, to train other teachers, but we have, at least we're trying to do it. And the last one is innovation and technology. We need to, 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 to put a lot of attention here. What we're doing, uh, trying to do is to promote collaborative work between the universities, the research centers, and businesses, and government to develop high-tech capabilities. We have proposed to develop a high-tech incubator system and strengthen technical labs. And we're already working on that. The idea is to develop and adapt the methodology and technical capacity to identify and select projects that have the potential to become successful, coach those projects to reach commercial viability. The idea is to finance it jointly by public and private funds. We're already working on that. The public funds, at least they have stated their interest to finance it. We're working with the private sector now. And we're going to use and base mainly on the Israeli experience, which have been very successful on this, on this uh, startup. Mm -hmm. Well, that's it. Thank you very much. And I'd be glad to answer any of your questions. <laughs>